And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have three newcomers to, th to the temple. The th the tri the triple-headed monster of Metis Media cre and creators of the upcoming 5e, 5e expansion Historia Arcanum. In one in one corner we have Sar in Sarp Duyar. In the second corner <laughs> Hello, we guys. in the second corner we have Dokan Scallion. And I'm and I apologize in advance for sc for screwing up pronunciation of the last name. And in the th and in the third corner. We have Dudu Berkman. How are you? How are you all doing today? Or tonight, I guess. Good. I guess. In my case, <laughs> yeah, it's, in your it's case. tonight. In our end. <laughs> have I mentioned I hate time zones? Because I do. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are kind of used to it, though. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. But now we are living uh, with the American time zone, so that's pretty mm -hmm. much okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. A bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Shall I take the first round? Yeah, please yeah, go yeah, on. Please. Uh, I mean, I've been a uh, video gamer as long as I can ever remember, but what got me into t tabletop RPGs was, you know, uh, I was at college first year. Uh, people in my uh, dorm room was asking around if anyone was playing D and D, and I was like, "Yeah, that would be fun," and that's how I got in. And from there on, I realized that hey, this is actually uh, a good way to output creativity. And I started, you know, dabbling with making my own systems for video game genre, like franchise. I like the first mm -hmm. one was actually Fallout, mm -hmm. and. It kind of stuck there. I became a forever GM after that exact moment because uh, the people who organized that first D&D &D, uh, essentially uh, only played for one session and then I, I had to take up the mantle. So I had to learn all the rules and all that stuff very fast. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's been maybe three years uh, since that day and I'm still a forever GM. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Um, one... one... One bad idea I've been kicking about for years is do, is doing it is doing a mock PS mock PSA of a forever GM support group. You know, sad sad music and all sad music and all like those lost puppy ads. I think that's yeah. necessary for the mental health issues. Yeah, the old face. You know, j for j for just for just for just, for just five cents a day, you too can help save these forever GMs. <laughs> Uh, or just learn the rules and run a fucking campaign. game. <laughs> yeah, true. That's going to be our next campaign. <laughs> but um, um, Doug, um, how did how did you get how did you get into the affairs? Okay, mine is a little bit funnier than Sarp's uh, because uh, I'm into this thing uh, through Sarp. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, it's it's quite a funny story. One day, one of my friends called me and says, uh, hey, well, a couple of my friends needs uh, help with a commercial and stuff. I, I was working as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and this particular friend is not a very uh, bright person, I should say. And I was like, N I wasn't caring that much about it. And like, uh, they give his number to me and I called them and stuff. And... They were saying stuff like, uh, we need a dragon uh, flying through the Istanbul. And so I was like, wait, hold on, hold on a minute. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think we have millions. Uh, and let, let's go for another strategy. Uh, like, I, I've, I know RPGs, but I didn't play them so far. And uh, Sarp like, ex explained me what they need and how we're going to do it and stuff. Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, you don't need a commercial. Uh, you need a media strategy instead of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and like we started talking, uh, there there was still a commercial idea, but like we changed it through and through. And I was uh, like, after a couple of weeks, I was like, I, I guess I'm working with them. <laughs> and uh, we started uh, like building in a, another perspective, building with another uh, strategy, and uh, we became a part of it, uh, essentially. Yep. The B and D part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, that, that that's how we get into the ending, like, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in the, uh, the, the, mean, the meanwhile, I said, uh, I told Sarp, like, I think we need to play this. Yeah, <laughs> like, to understand what, yeah. what are we yeah. dealing with. It goes without saying. Yeah. Well, I'm a noob as well, mm-hmm. as you can tell. I, I do the social media. Mm-hmm. And I, well, basically, Dog called me and said, like, yeah, we're doing this. And then we need a social media manager. And then I, I jumped in. And then, yeah, one day we gathered all in, in a house. And then we were like, yes, we're going to, like, actually get to know what are we dealing with. <laughs> and I'm a musical theater kid. So I love, 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 like, a role play sort of stuff anyways. And I'd much rather, like do this than a uh, regular video video game sort of stuff so i really like D after mm-hmm. that and i can i can cer- i can certainly i can certainly appreciate a, f- a fellow um a fellow theater kid given my own ex- given my own experiences and my and some of my old crew torturing me whenever i had whenever i had to do corpsing <laughs> <laughs> Every, no matter no matter what, everyone will try and find a try and find a way to make you crack. <laughs> uh, especially since I was the one person who did who who um was the last per- was the last person to break whenever that ca- whenever that duty came. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but now give now I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pick on you. I'm not gonna pick on you, dude, for be, for being a new, for being a noob at this kind of thing. Because well, everybody's everybody's gonna start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But given, but given, given that, um, I'd like you, to, given the given the um, back given the background and transition from from ad- from adapting other IPs to you guys um. Creating Historica Arcanum, um, mm-hmm. I'd like you to walk me through the ch- the chain of events to the creation of this book. Mm. Uh, Wait, shall I take the lead? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. So uh, the first idea was that uh, you know we are all, like, especially in the creative side, we all love uh, introducing like historical elements to our games. Like, especially mm-hmm. I adore it. I do read a lot of history and one of the common themes that i wanted to explore in my games especially not through dnd but through call of Cthulhu games was introducing this you know uh, uh late 19th century istanbul and once we started actually playing a couple of games on that setting we realized hey this is pretty amazing and uh it would be a shame if we did not share this with literally everybody who was in on the, uh, you know, in on this hobby. So we started a few draft materials, and then eventually we realized that hey, there's a thing called Kickstarter. We didn't know back in the day when we were creating mm-hmm. the first draft. So we said, why don't we actually turn this into a full-fledged project uh, where we can actually get some high-quality artists and all that involved, and. Once we started thinking a bit more professional, also the scope changed because then we came up with even bigger ideas, essentially turning and creating this uh, franchise, Historica Arcanum, and basically trying to be the Assassin's Creed of D&D. Mm-hmm. And like, the idea is to first and foremost introduce Historica Arcanum with this current book, The City of Crescent and then start exploring other historical settings that hasn't been explored before and essentially create a full-on ip on top of that like just like you know how assassin's creed has a lot of like common concepts even between different time zones but still holding a sense of you know uh flavor of the time zone we want to do the same thing you know common villains common factions uh cults and whatnot appear will will Mm -hmm. appear in all of our uh in all historic arcanum books and hopefully we get to create uh, help you help uh, gms and players create you know this mega campaigns where you can start taking off your adventuring party from let's say bronze age all the way towards cold war mm-hmm. <laughs> through you know like different bloodlines and whatnot but the you know the humble beginnings of it was us 
thinking how great it would be to put Istanbul, especially with this you know, mystified version of it, uh, on a lot of people's uh, role-playing tables. And then it became a professional project, and then it became huge. Mm -hmm. Now... I'd now because of the because of the fact that it's a that it's a significant um, cornerstone with with um, Historica Arcanum. Mm -hmm. I'd like um, I'd like to focus a bit on this uh, on this vision of nineteenth century Istanbul. Mm -hmm. um, what about what about that what about that particular area and that particular era um, st um, stood out to you enough to have to have that be the focus? Uh, for me, you guys can also answer that. I, I shouldn't be the only one talking, but mm -hmm. for me, the important part was the fact that, okay, so uh, when we create such a product, we actually us, the content creators, won't make it to the final product. The final product will be for GMs, mm -hmm. and that is going to be a significant undertaking for introducing people to a new history based setting and expect people who have never been to Istanbul, never actually lived the culture, to be able to tell the tale. So we had to find a good enough time period where it is it's still authentic, but uh, you know, global trends are there. And that's why we picked nineteenth century, because in nineteenth century Istanbul was one of the most globalized places on earth. Mm -hmm. Uh like, you know, people from all corners of the world, Christian missionaries, tourists, archaeologists were pouring in, into the, this, you know, huge city, one of the biggest at the time. I think it was like the third biggest city. I could be wrong. And there we could, you know, essentially amalgamate the city's culture with uh, common themes that GMs and players have seen in previous RPG games uh, so as to not scare people off or so as not to, uh, you know, uh, cut their uh, historical immersion short. Mm -hmm. That's why we specifically picked 19th century Istanbul. Yeah. And on top of that, actually, it's kind of uh, important for the Ottoman Empire's capital mm. to be modernized mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in that specific time zone because uh, Ottoman Empire resisted uh, to the modernism, the postmodernism for a really long time, but uh, in in specifically uh, the, uh, that particular time, uh, they were like, uh, okay, I think we need to catch up with the world, uh, we need to correct our wrongs and stuff, so mm -hmm. Istanbul was in, a, uh, in the middle of a great change and it's still a very globalized uh, city and uh, still very popular city in that era. Uh, so it was uh, kind of important for the world because the name was there, the prestige was there, but also uh, the uh, technology, the, the times technology were uh, also there, and uh, the uh, the authority was kind of uh, getting lower uh, for the uh, royal family and stuff. So uh, it was a really chaotic and a modern and a very fun time to live, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now. With the, now, with that in mind, since you're met, since <clears throat> since you since you mentioned introducing this introducing this particular this particular setting to people, um, how how did what what were some of the things that you wanted to focus on to make to to introduce to introduce this kind of place to to a lot to a lot of um, a lot of gaming audiences who still who much to my annoyance, still ha still have this idea of of fantasy having a very Western Europe kind of um, basis. I mean, it's I, I think it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the very critical things when we first started this project, especially when we were talking to Western people, was people were scared of Mr. Presenting because there wasn't enough material there. And the material that was put out earlier was essentially quite stereotypical, so I can perfectly understand their uh, concerns regarding using those stuff. And we then we just said, hey, why don't we make the material ourselves? And once it's there, I think the problem will, uh, to a large extent, go away. And on top of that, I think it is, like, after we hopefully manage to do this, I think it is going to bring a lot of, uh, you know, life to a, uh, or like a lot of vibrancy to a hobby that's been basically more or less the same high fantasy setting with different flavors mm -hmm. sure you can have steampunk for instance but again most of that relies on the same 
like very very basic assumptions of uh, you know like you know Tolkien's mythology. Dwarves still speak Scottish. Elves are still kind of cocky, and humans are the go-to race for almost everyone. So you know we need to bring some new life to this hobby. And the I don't think the answer is just by making stuff up because when you make stuff up, it just becomes a postmodern version of what was there. Mm -hmm. So we have to pull from a fountain uh, of a you know cultural trove of content there. So it's it's actually here. It's actually there, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, all these Near Eastern myths, legends. Uh, it's just that most Western people are not exposed to it. There is a huge, you know, library corpus of material there. It's just that nobody has actually opened it to pull stuff from. Uh, and we want to, at least with this first book, be the tiniest bridge. And especially coming with our, like, hopefully our second product, which we want to explore the Silk Road with. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we want to pull as much stuff as possible and just bring it to the limelight for everyone. Mm-hmm. No. And also, like, uh, from a mythical and cultural standpoint, uh, when we look at the world's myths, mm -hmm. uh, they don't invade each other. Like, uh, yes. they kind of work with each other. Uh, there's always a reflection of uh, Loki in, uh, for example, in the uh, ancient Greek mythology or mm -hmm. in Lovecraft mythology. Like, they usually uh, are integrated in each other. So, like, it's not mm -hmm. so hard mm -hmm. to uh, just pull up something new. Uh, because yes. uh, it's it's always satisfactory for the people who is listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that kind with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'd like I'd like to talk I'd like to talk a bit about the um, about about some of the some of the player facing material that's get that is go that is going to be added, and I'd say. I'd say I'd like to st I'd say I'd like to start out with something with something a little bit um I guess sm I guess smaller would would be the way would be the way I'd put it even though even though that's not exactly accurate with some of the um with two since in the quick start um mm -hmm. version of the version of the book there's two um subclasses that that are that are put in mm -hmm. and. I would I would like to I would like to get kind of a feel for what what sort what sort of what sort of play style that these two, that these two would um these two mm -hmm. these two would encourage and I'll start with the College of Shadow Actors like what the mm -hmm. rep, what the um, inspiration for it is and what sort of play style <laughs> it's encouraging. Actually, it's great that you asked about College of Shadow Actors because it is actually inspired by a I think six hundred year old tradition of. Uh, you know, this public festivities where uh, two very important figures, which you will meet in the book, mm -hmm. uh, has been used as a way of, you know, entertaining the masses. Uh, they are this, they are this, you know, 700 years old public figures, public comedians who got executed, but they still live through traditions. And we essentially wanted to highlight and pull from that mythology uh, and bring it to essential life again with this shadow of actor class. Mm -hmm. For gameplay, it essentially falls on you know summoning uh, monsters from shadows. So it is essentially a summoner class if we you know have different classes in D and D. And uh, again, uh, some of its abilities are to put some distance between yourself and the danger, if, if you're talking about combat ones, mm -hmm. and basically be able to create an environment where this bard could excel in combat by you know manipulating shadows, dimming lights, and ensuring you are the one that shines the brightest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's uh, a great final. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should. I, it I didn't know it was poetic. <laughs> and the other. Um... The other archetype I, w I wanted to discuss on this regard is the Jin Master and subsequently yes. the Jin Patron. Yes, I mean uh, that was essential. That had to be there, right? Mm -hmm. And we have seen a lot of references to Jins in Five E and all the other role playing material, and we actually dig through all of uh, you know video game stuff too to make sure if anyone actually got it right. But most got it wrong. Uh, the current method of introducing jinns to uh, any type of medium is essentially through positioning themselves as what in, for instance, Miristi mythology are just like basic demons. Mm -hmm. If they are here on this plane as a, a physical being and they can 
you know, in a way be killed, those tend to be demons or iblis in uh, Near Eastern myths and legends. But we wanted to present Jin as a living being, which is correct, but can interact with this world in a like a more metaphysical way, which essentially has to, in a magical world, amalgamate uh, real magic with some uh, interplanar being uh, mm -hmm. present there. So it is going to be an interesting one, and we are still running the uh, both the flavor text and uh, the actual you know mechanics of it. But I think that was going to be one of the most fun, uh, most fun warlock archetypes that people players can ever play, because the idea is to make that class into this very high risk, high reward. Where the more of the gin you invite to your body, the more stronger you get. But then uh, the chances are, if you fail to contain, or if you you know have a slight lapse in your judgment, slight lapse in your constitution it can take over and it will be very hard to be convinced to let go if you can convince at all. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> with now with that in with that in mind, it's when it comes to the, when it comes to the idea of a of a gen as a as a um, pa as a patron um um how is would it be well, I'll um, I'll dance around it and I'll go I'll go what um since you meant since you mentioned that a lot of people in your a lot of um interpretations in your in your opinion get the idea of a jinn wrong um is it ju is it just is it just that jinn are treated like a like a type of demon or is it or are there or are there other aspects that you think a lot of people miss uh, well, like uh, most of the people who don't, who are not native to these concepts are uh, thinking that they are uh, equal to demons and stuff. But uh, it's mostly believed in uh, Eastern cultures that our jinns are real. Uh, they have a place in the holy books and stuff, and they live in the same physical places with you, but you can't see them and they can't see you, uh, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, but like uh, they are, they are just another form of creatures. Uh, most of the people believe, but it's always intimidating to see one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, and and it's told that they are uh, smart creatures and stuff. So it's kind of a, another form of uh, smart living being with you, but from another realm. That that's basically the core mm -hmm. uh, thinking standpoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, one thing that if anyone actually wants to dig deeper is there is some I think 14th century illustration of jinns by one Mehmet Siyah Kalem. If you, you know, just try to type in what you've heard from me. Uh, the guy, I think, lived in, again, like 1200s uh, Khorasan, some like, you know, very important places on the Silk Road. And he is known to be this very mystical figure who drew supernatural beings in a very, very... Um, vivid manner, uh, especially considering the uh, time's, you know, access to artistic material. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a very interesting figure uh, that should be, that could be studied by uh, people who are interested in these sorts of, you know, uh, legends. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that, one thing that I noticed with the, that I found peculiar with the writing style in the quick, in the quick start book is a lot of it is a lot of it is written like you're reading the like you're reading someone's journal um yes. <laughs> written in a very fir in a, in a some in a somewhat first person approach with mm -hmm. uh, finally several... someone noticed <laughs> <laughs> really it took it took this long for some it look, took this long for someone to point this out i mean no no but like uh, probably we, someone noticed we but just they hope... never pointed out loud <laughs> we were just hoping that someone brings this up <laughs> yeah it's some uh, it's de it's definitely an it's definitely an uncommon uncommon approach to to doing to doing it especially for an especially for an RPG book. Um, a lot of a lot of them won't a lot of them don't really do this sort this sort of first person narration. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was I was curious if one that's some, that's something that's going to be present in the in the final book and to, and two. Um, what gave you guys the idea to do it? Um, nothing in particular, to be honest. I think this was a mo more fun way of 
introducing these concepts to it because like in my mind it was always going to be straight like you know the hook to bringing all these characters player characters to istanbul was going to be that they need they were outsiders and they came to istanbul to find something obviously no spoilers there mm -hmm. uh but you know and that they wanted someone to introduce them to this culture and then we wanted to position the dm to be this one person uh obviously that is entirely dependent on how play how players and dms want to run this but that's the style that we wanted to go for uh, as we wrote this mm -hmm. i mean but again it was a purely artistic decision but i will say that uh we will keep this approach and you will meet this one very specific person in game that is going to be acting as following like acting as the person to be the you know uh, the gandalf essentially to be the guide mm -hmm. Oh. And like usually in, uh, I think it's a reflex for us, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for like a, uh, okay, so in Turkish and Eastern cultures, there are usually uh, not very, uh, how should I put it, like uh, the history books are usually learned from someone's or someone's writings because uh, the official writings are really only from the palace and stuff and you don't get mm -hmm. like too much information from it mm -hmm. uh, and so we learned our history through these journals and stuff so it's kind of a reflex for us to uh, to go to it when you uh, mm -hmm. talk about history when you tell your stories and stuff because most of the stories that that you can hear from the street and stuff is not in the books of the palace mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. there are usually journals and stuff so i think it's kind of a reflex yeah and also one thing that I want to mention, I think that is one of the great features of Historic Arcanum. I, like literally 10 seconds ago, I mentioned that we're going to have a guide. And the cool part is that guide is actually, uh, the person that we have in mind is very significant historically. So uh, when people actually read about this uh, person, they will find out that, hey, they took this one person's life and managed to somehow, you know, arcanify it and integrated it into the book and that is something that we want to keep doing it with uh this historic arcanum series mm -hmm. like for instance imagine all you know for instance borgias in assassin's creed 2 and brotherhood i think and obviously revelations by the way that was also set in istanbul <laughs> yeah. uh I, I i think that is such a great way of uh, integrating fact with fiction mm -hmm. now and it's it's interesting that you mentioned the whole the whole um, concept of fact of fact with fiction. Given um, given one part of the BCR you've hinted at is is a, is essentially Dracula's head. Yeah. <laughs> or if or if I if I if I have to if I have to be if I have to be pedantic about it, the head of um, Vlad Tepes. Um, yes. But one of the, one of the big one of the bigger one of the bigger um, mechanical and narrative things that you guys are that you guys are bringing in is the profession system mm -hmm. um i'd like you i'd like you to go into what inspired that and what your what your what your plans are when it comes to introducing this and how and how it's going to work within the sandbox uh one thing that I wanted to do as the guy who's writing the mechanic side of the book mm -hmm. was to make sure that in every product that we made, we would have some experimental mechanics uh, that we would just throw out and see if it actually does stick with the community, if people actually like it. Like, for instance, if people would actually want to play with professions, even without our you know, historic arcanum campaign, then mm -hmm. it says a lot of things that people want to have this and we would you know create more supplements on it so it is more of an experimental mechanic that we want to include and what does that entail and how did we came up with i mean what does that entail they can just check out the kickstarter page uh but how we came up with that was um like for instance you have your backgrounds right but your backgrounds don't tell much about what you do even the word adventure what does that mean like what the adventure against do you just kill monsters or do you you know uh you know is your entire retirement plan just get killing monsters and selling off loot and you know reinvesting that or something so you want to include a very specific uh, type of uh 
gameplay mechanic, gameplay mechanic also incorporating some underused parts of the fifth edition by you know giving players something to actually do and you know increase like you know level up on the uh, in exchange or in par with their you know class you know you have your mmos where you are you know let's say level 20 warrior but you can also be level 5 blacksmith and that is a that that is a feeling that we want to go on from and hopefully if, if the community likes it maybe we can turn it into this you know massive supplement where if you are let's say a jeweler of level 10 you would need a blacksmith of level 5 to bring you a certain type of ingot so that you can create your jewel you know all of these that we thought of prepared in our drafts and we will implement it if uh i mean the camp this campaign is already going pretty good but you know implement it further once uh we realize that the demand is there yeah now Earth, now, in the in the um, in this in the quick start, you get you gave a bit of an example of the bounty hunter profession. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I will I will note I do I do like the the simplicity of its of its advancement being based on the CR mm -hmm. of bounties that you turn uh, that you turn in. It's a nice, mm -hmm. elegant way to not have to not um double to not double dip on on XP setups, but. Mm -hmm. In the in the graphic where where that is shown, um, where it shows the whole, whole image of Path of the Headhunter, it seems to imply mm -hmm. a a a branching setup. Is that mm -hmm. how professions are going to work? Um, yes. Generally, I mean, let, let let's say you're a bounty hunter, right? Then you know, the more you get, <coughs> the more experience you get as a bounty hunter, the more specialized you will be. Are you taking bounties on humans or like humanoids or? Are we taking bounties on gargantuan beasts, or are we taking, for instance, bounties just like a Witcher on supernatural phanta phantasmal beings? Mm -hmm. And you get you get to you actually get to specialize uh, and pick this you know very specific profession that you want to be. Yeah. Now, with with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'd also see I'd also seen that th that um. That there's a that it looks like there's going to be a bounty hunter DM section for mm -hmm. integra for integrating that. So it's not so it's not a case of the one other guy. Um, yeah. When it comes to the other professions, is there going to be something similar as far as providing advice on how to integrate professions Absolutely. into play? Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. Everything will be like at the moment. We should have around five professions, mm -hmm. if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. With the stretch goals, it will go up if we keep doing well with this uh, Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And all those professions will have branching paths and will have, uh, you know, DM sections on how to integrate those concepts to do their games, how to, uh, you know, create quests out of them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... I know that I know that there's going to be a main qu a main quest line, but just fr just from looking at um, a t a toolbox setup with uh, with the fact that um that you that you're drawing so much from 19th century um it 19th 19th century Constantinople um one of the, one of the one of the big questions that ends up that ends up coming up in um any sort of urban fantasy approach regard regardless regardless of where it is in the world is how is how you can still have people go people going into adventures or or crawls or or the like in in a ma in a massive urban sprawl great great question i talk that a lot do you guys want to talk about how massive these stumbles catacombs are <laughs> uh, i mean like uh it's it's only accurate yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, for probably the people who's never been in Istanbul, it's uh, kind of a lay master, but uh, ju I, I should just say that whatever that you can think of, uh, like is is in the pitch of your imagination, is uh, right about there. Like you, you can uh, you can just go any direction that you want uh, with uh, with any idea in your mind, and you'll uh, be satisfied with the outcome in Istanbul mm -hmm. yeah there's something I mean, for everyone like 
even for you know the dungeon crawling and all of that uh below istanbul lies the old istanbul and this is actually historically accurate it is full of catacombs buried temples and you know istanbul is a almost a three thousand year old city and all of that is just built on top of one another so you know uh there was this one documentary about how people were talking about the ways of accessing these catacombs and you know mm -hmm. you go to this antique shop and there is this door that they're not using and when you actually open it you go below mm -hmm. ground towards like you know millennia old catacombs and this is just a fact of life in the city of istanbul mm -hmm. and, and everybody mm -hmm. has one of these stories like yes. uh, it, it's, yeah. it's not it, it's it's not news it's not yes. like uh, my uh, like I experienced something that like uh, we were just walking by a village and like we we just stopped there to get some water and stuff, and people were like sitting in, in like a cafe for and they were like sitting in a very weird thing, very weird white-ish thing, and like we we just uh, take a look, and it was a column, it was yeah. a, it was the ancient Greek column that they were sitting yeah. on, and like we we told them and they were like yeah we know. <laughs> So no stuff one, like this yeah, is just like yeah. it, it's 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 just every day. It's 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 Monday in Istanbul. So mm -hmm. <laughs> also when it comes yeah, when it came to um when it came to talk when it came to talking about the districts, don't think you don't think I wasn't gonna notice that you snuck in um the the not the nod of Abdul El Hazred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. I mean, one of our core uh inspirations was obviously lovecraft mm -hmm. like uh, and i think combining lovecraftian uh a, like yeah, lovecraftian mythos with this, you know near eastern myths and legends especially like you know when you take when you consider the timeline you know the 19th century especially late 19th century is perfect fit for this lovecraftian horror we mm -hmm. couldn't resist but you know doing a nod and there will be a lot of like quests inspired by this you know cosmic horror mm -hmm. yeah now um with whenever you whenever you're dealing with um whenever you're dealing with a set with a setting that with a setting that is for lack of a better term removed from removed from the norm um mm -hmm. there's always there's always an issue there's always the issue of the magic question um just mm -hmm. as an example I had I had discussed I discussed with someone else yesterday on how if I if I'm running if I'm running a game that's that is based more on um more more on eat more on East Asian mythos mm -hmm. the the whole con the whole concept of the wizard sequestered in sequestered in his tower surrounded by books isn't re isn't really something that it translate so yeah. the so the wizard so the wizard class would have to have some hackery done to it uh, in order to work. Mm -hmm. Um. Not, not the name. Not that anybody willingly picks wi willingly picks wizards, but. <laughs> uh, um. And when and when it comes to, and because of the because of how intrinsically tied to it to, to um to the city that, to the city of Crescent that this particular approach is. I bl I believe it's mentioned that there's going to be some. Magic options for me for messing with the default rules of how magic yes. works. Yes, I'd like 100%. you to go into I that. Mean, I mean, uh, the first idea was that we prepared this toolbox for DMs to integrate mm -hmm. 5e with their you know, his alternate history campaigns, and even there, we're going to be talking about several options that players can, like DMs, can go for mm -hmm. uh, to explain how magic exists in history and how to you know influence spellcasting rules. And we will have that. And on top of that, we're going to have the historic Arcanum canon, where we actually explain how magic came to be and what are the effects of the magic uh, in this universe, how it affected history, how it affected, you know, classes and all of that. So you will get a lot of you know, flavored texts explaining how uh, different how to describe this world's magic differently on top of some mechanical inputs from us. Mm -hmm. So that has been considered and will be there on the book. Yeah. Now, because of, because of the fact that you essentially have a you you're essentially going with a magical spin on 
a part of and a piece of histor a piece of um of historical fiction. Um there there is the there is the question of 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 do, of dealing with non-human races and how to and how to integrate them. And this is something I always ask when people are doing a campaign setting about what what races would be compatible and what would and what would be a little bit tricky. Um when it comes to what is your, what is your take about integrating um some of the non-human um fantasy races that have been in D&D? into this into the city of crescent do you guys want to take this one yeah sure uh, like first of all it's easy for female characters uh, <laughs> because they're usually covering up and stuff uh, but uh, all jokes aside uh, we are using the history part of our campaign uh, in our advantage in a way mm -hmm. so uh, when we are talking about uh, any kind of race or uh, any kind of a class uh, when uh, like on the street it's actually when it's how you put up your limit for example uh, when you're dealing with for uh, let's say an elf uh, it, they're settled they're uh, not so hard to understand but uh, still like when it's normal in uh, the in story arcs it's it's always uh, there kind of actually mm -hmm. uh, okay let, let, let me let me replace it so uh, when you put the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, in the top of everything, and uh, when they have this welcoming uh, understanding for all the races and stuff, uh, it's it's all done uh, mm -hmm. in advance. So uh, we are thinking of uh, the globalization of uh, that time era as Istanbul as a very welcoming and very normal place for uh, non-human uh, beings to live. So. Uh, it's not for, it's not hard for our campaign, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one that's that's definitely good. That's definitely good to hear, since um, I can since I could easily see I could easily see the argument that some that some races would be tr would be trickier to work yeah. to work with. And one of the big elephants in the room that comes to mind is. Is a is a dragonborn just walking just walking around the place when most <laughs> when everybody is um, smaller than them, um, <laughs> but that that might be a bit that might be a bit of my own biases be, being the fact that every time every time I go to do game night or, or something at my LGS, I'm always a foot taller than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. You can be a uh, leper man, be wearing a face mask and mm -hmm. be covering up because, again, you're a leper. And we will, that, that's also one of the parts that we want to talk about in the, you know, alternate history toolbox where how, you know, yeah, sure, you're running a uh, alternate history game, but you're running it on 5th edition. And what do you do with all these, uh, you know, magical beings walking around and we're going to be adding several of mostly flavor options where mm -hmm. uh you know it ranges from yeah they're there people just don't tend to notice it because of magic to yeah they really do hide themselves from society and mm -hmm. the way we will go with this in historic arcadam is more on the they hide themselves in society type of way but again all of those will be covered in detail so dms who want to actually get into nitty-gritty will find a lot of good stuff mm -hmm. to take for their own campaigns and to run historic card kind of games all right i get and by the way we are so sorry but we have another meeting coming yes. up in five minutes <laughs> so let's wrap <laughs> up all right so 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 sorry about that i ended up getting i ended up getting a bit carried away but no problem um, no problem <laughs> So I, I do want to, I do want to offer my con offer my congratulations on get on getting on getting funded in eight hours. What would you be shoot What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, we want to be done with the content by the end of the year, like hundred percent. PDF is will be ready. Mm -hmm. You know, we would just run into last uh, last minute editing and whatnot. And at that point, we want to be doing the uh, print runs by the end of January and if everything goes as planned people will receive their books by the end of uh, February mm -hmm. but then again uh, we all of us live through 2020 nobody knows what's going to happen 
but we gave ourselves a you know good deal of time uh, in order to uh, you know get everything uh, way ahead of the deadline that we set for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as a, and I will um, I will I I will certainly be keeping an eye on how on how that on how that develops. Yes. Um, especially and in in lieu in lieu of not jinxing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hope not. Um, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto uh, the show and pleasure. enjoy and enjoy the madness at play here. And <laughs> anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often Absolutely. say around here, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> right. <laughs> Perfect. And we will keep that in mind. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>